Hi, Tom Stewart here with Clean Business Today. I'm with my uh, partner, Ms. Trotter, and we've invited a special guest today, Joe Walsh from Green Clean Maine up in Portland, Maine. Hello, Joe. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Joe's uh, hanging out somewhere uh, in the mountains in his uh, ski chalet. <laughs> is that condo? How about that? That's right. We have snow on the ground here. You can see. So much yeah. snow, too. Yeah. That's incredible. It's, I don't know, it's probably 80 degrees down here today. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, we're going to be spending a, a good part of our, our time today uh, discussing the developments over the weekend with Small Business Administration and the various loan programs they have and how some things changed next Friday. Remember, we keep saying that uh, it feels like a month's worth of stuff changes in a day and Mondays look very much different than Fridays. And well, this Monday is, is no different. So we're going to walk you through the leaders of the night. And Joe, I know he's been studying this and he's got a lot of resources and he's going to, going to help us sort some of that out. Um, I wanted to jump in and answer the question that Liz wanted us to address today. And I'm going to share my share my screen here, and this is going to do that whole flashback thing again. You can tell it like it is, Tom. I'm going to tell it like it is. If I can get my computer to behave, yeah, that's good enough. Um, should be able to. Do that. Okay. What we wanted to do, we, the question came up Friday. Um, you know, can you get in trouble for using the term disinfectant? And, you know, can you actually get yourself legally fined? I guess, Liz, you heard that some people, there's a rumor flowing around out there that, that, that people are actually getting fined for using the, the, the term disinfectant. $30,000 was, was the number that was being floated to. Wow. Uh, yeah. I uh, talked to Janice and asked her the question, and she did a little research for us and kind of summed it up. So I'm just gonna gonna walk you you you, you through it. There's a couple of uh, government entities that are involved in this, or one really. It's the Environmental Protection Agency, it basically regulates disinfectants as an antimicrobial pesticide. So the first thing that we need to do is get our mind wrapped around the idea that uh, disinfectants are the same as pesticides. They kill living things. Um, all the way back in 1947, there was a law passed called the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA, okay? This law regulates a lot of what we still do today uh, in terms of how we handle uh, pesticides and, and uh, disinfectant. It is a, vi and according to this act, it is a violation of federal law to use any product in a manner that is inconsistent with its labeling. I say any product, any disinfectant. This is a disinfectant wipe. This is your old Lysol disinfectant cleaner. I'm holding these up. You can't see them, can you? Yeah, we can. You can? Yeah. Can you see my screen too? No, but we can see you. Yeah, we can see your screen. Sorry, Tom. And we can see you. Okay. Well, cool. Well, if you read the back of the disinfectant wipe or any disinfectant, it says under directions of you, the first thing it says is it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. I don't know how many times I've ever read that and completely was oblivious to the fact that this law saying if I don't use this according to the label, I might be, you know, I'm violating federal law, but but you are. It's kind of like maybe ripping a tag off of a pillow. You know, that's there's laws against that too. But as it pertains to uh, disinfectant. Uh, the the very things that that, that uh, could be considered as a failure to follow would be uh, the dilution, 
how, you know, how you dilute it, if you're not diluting it properly, the contact time, method of application, or any other thing that the label says, if you don't do it exactly the way that it says, and you, you and you, you're claiming that you're disinfecting, really you aren't, and, 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 and technically you're in violation of federal law. Now, I'm not aware of any example where people have been convicted and fined and gone to jail for that. But we did find in a trade journal, Infection Control Today, that the EPA, in conjunction with the Center for D Disease Control, states that by law, any applicable label instructions on EPA registered products must be followed. Uh, this fine print here that we just talked about. If the user selects exposure conditions that differ from those on the EPA registered label, the user assumes liability for any injuries resulting from off label use and is potentially subject to enforcement action under FIFRA. Said another way, you as a business owner are, are, are you know, responsible for training your people and making sure these products are being used properly. If not, you know, you could uh, actually be subject to federal uh, fines and maybe worse. You're also leaving yourself open to civil suits. This hasn't been, a, to my knowledge, a big issue from a, from a cleaning contractor standpoint today. But this is a new normal. This is a new world. And you got a whole lot of people running around out there now buying Tyvek suits and misting stuff, making claims that they're disinfecting. And if they're doing that in a building and they find out that, that people got sick because we didn't do it, thankfully, or you can actually make yourself sick by missing a disinf misting a disinfectant and breathing it in. I mean, just a lot of things that are happening now that, you know, just because it hasn't happened in the past doesn't mean that it, that it, it might not happen in the future. So my advice would be to, I guess, be careful <laughs> that we're using things properly and don't uh, don't overreach. Don't sell jobs and do work that you're not um, trained and, 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 and qualified to do. Is, is 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 I guess my general advice on all of this. So uh, Robin is saying it, it's probably better to say that they're using an EPA disinfectant to sanitize and disinfect. I might even take off that and disinfect if it was me. Yeah. Um, you know, um, using an EPA disinfectant to sanitize. Um, I think you could probably say that pretty, pretty honestly. Um, uh, Tom, uh, to, to get just a hair more clarity, I think that what you were saying is the chances of being fined $30,000 for using the word disinfect all on its own, probably not, not something that's happening. But um, there could potentially be fines for saying that you're disinfecting something and re when in reality, maybe not so much. Yeah, I think that's possible. Fines. I think maybe even the bigger risk, though, is civil action, getting sued for for damages. Either your own employees killing themselves by like breathing these again disinfectants are, you know, it's it's it's, it's poison. It, it's um, a pesticide, and you know, I I, I see people with fogs and. I mean, you got to have all the right PPE in terms of the right respirators and all of that stuff. And I've just got concerned that there's people out there who are, you know, looking for an opportunity to make a make some money in a market where a lot of our traditional revenue has gone away. But they're they're maybe taking risks that 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 they shouldn't. That would be my concern. I just want to check in real quick. Susan, is the feedback better with us muting with Joe and? Um, with me muting. And I'm not muting, I'm just sitting here talking, but. Uh, there is a lag on that tongue, but okay. I think it's fair to assume. Okay, good. Okay. So we're, we're good with uh, the whole disinfectant thing. And I, uh, I guess just, you know, be careful. 
and make sure that that that, that we have all the proper training all the, the the proper equipment and all the you know we you know there's a lot that goes into to, to doing disinfection especially in, in 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 hot sites where you know I, I see more and more where where companies and, and individuals want us to come in and, 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 and clean space where there was a known COVID-19 case and you know, I could see us getting to the point with the proper training and and and, and equipment and 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 chemicals where we could do that. But at the at the at the moment, I'm I don't think many of us are prepared to do that. So, we will, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what we were talking about Friday, and talk about uh, small business administration and 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 some of the programs that are out there and how things have changed in the last uh, last couple of days in that regard. And Joe, um, I guess if, if you could kind of get us started, I mean, I know that you've been doing a ton of research on this and you've got a lot of resources that, that, that you've kind of put together in, in, in a network. Could you just kind of give us an overview of uh, what the Small Business Administration is doing and what we as small businesses uh, should be thinking about doing in terms of taking advantage of, of, of some of the help that's out there for us? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for having me on the call, Tom. And it's uh, nice to be here. And um, I actually just spent my afternoon looking through all the resources, that, uh, reputable resources I could get my hands on and uh, think that I've got some good um, answers in terms of what the SBA is offering, making a little bit more sense of it. So I'll just preface everything I say by the fact that I am not a CPA and um, I'm not uh, even a bookkeeper, really. So um, you'll definitely want to consult with um, your own professionals and advisors on this. But I do think that um, I can give an overview of what I've discovered today, just kind of sharing business owner and a business owner. This is what I see as the opportunities. So, um, you know, I would start, I'm going to pull up some notes I have on my screen here. Is it possible for me to share my screen or can I, it might be helpful, I think, for folks if I did that. Yeah, sure. Joe, there's sh down in the, uh, the tray there where like you mute, if you go a couple over at all so that you can uh, share your screen. Okay. Now I have to try and do this without causing the, uh, the feedback uh video feedback effect here so let's see what i can do okay so i've pulled this up is it showing up now it is it is great so um i've got a um an emergency response plan i'm happy to share a template of this um with everyone when the call's over would love to share it if, hopefully it could be of use uh to to anyone out there, but um, basically, you know, the financial piece of our emergency response plan at Green Clean Maine has us bolstering our cash, posi cash position and making sure that we're optimizing all these um, local, state, and federal relief programs. There's a lot going on out there. I think everyone's a little confused or a lot confused as to how everything fits together. Um, and uh, the idea here is just to support a return to full operations as soon as is safe or feasible and um, to keep our team members financially secure in the interim. So um, I'll share some of the update sources I've been looking at. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has an awesome update site where you can download some really good resources. So I highly recommend that you check that out. Um, when you go to it, it's really uh, well laid out and um, easy to follow. Um, definitely a reputable source there. The SBA disaster site's another good one. And then um, this would only apply to me, but you might think of similar resources. So we use Paylocity as our payroll provider. Um, Paylocity is an online payroll platform and um, they have been providing email updates and their email updates are excellent because their payroll platform has to automate all of these new regulations and all these new reimbursements and stuff. So they've been a really good um, source. And then uh, a local law firm. So the, the place, the law firm where our labor attorney works has also been sending some really good updates. So again, use your own you know, professionals in that, but I definitely trust my labor attorney to give me good, good information. Um, so what you basically have is there's a few um, 
SBA pieces that kind of fit together. So I'll, I'll share with you what I know right now. So um, the biggest one seems to be the that people have questions about is the Paycheck Protection Program. So I'll skip to that. So this is an SBA loan. It's partially forgivable and it's administered through your bank. Okay. So um, I think everyone on this call is going to be eligible. You just have to have under 500 employees and be affected by COVID. So it's pretty easy. Um, and by the way, I wasn't on the call on Friday. So please stop me if I'm reviewing things that don't need to be reviewed right, right now. This is good, yeah. This is okay. good. Um, so, uh, you know, as, in terms of the loan amount, um, it's two and a half times the average monthly payroll costs in the one year prior to the loan origination date. So if you, you know, if the loan drops for you on May 1st, then it's going to be the, uh, the maximum loan amount is two and a half the average, two and a half times the average monthly payroll costs um, for the previous um, 12 months. So uh, it's the average over the previous 12 months. Um, so it's one month times 2.5. And then um, any of that amount that isn't forgiven under the terms that I review in a minute, uh, then gets termed out uh, for 10 years at 4% maximum interest. So let's say you get a loan for $100,000, you spend 50,000 of it on allowed expenses through the program, that 50,000 is forgiven, you then owe 50,000 back, that gets termed out up to 10 years um, at 4% interest. And of course, if you didn't actually use those funds, you can just return them to the SBA. There's no prepayment penalty or any fees associated with this at all from anything that I can see. Um, and also, uh, those payments for the amount that's not forgiven is uh, deferred up to six months, which is also really great um, for you. And these loans are available through June 30th. So you don't need to, for the purpose of making sure you get your loan, apply right away. You have time to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, so the forgiveness. So this is the part I know I needed a lot of clarity on. So basically forgiveness, you know, means you don't have to pay back whatever portion of the loan is forgiven. So uh, what you'll, what will be forgiven is eight weeks of um, payroll costs from the origination date of the loan. Payroll costs, by the way, includes um, salaries, wages, vacation, um, any severance pay you paid, um, uh, group health care benefits, including insurance premiums, any retirement benefits, um, and any state or local payroll taxes. So it's all covered. Also covered is mortgage loan interest. Interest on any other debt that you had prior to this loan is also covered and, and will be basically paid for by the federal government. Any lease payments you have and any utility payments you have. So it's pretty compelling. Like that's a pretty awesome amount that you can just get given to you. Um, however, uh, I got a question, Joe. Can I yep. interrupt you real quick? Did yep. You, right. Did you say anything about uh, sick pay being forgiven? Sick pay is not forgiven because as I understand it, that is covered under a separate credit. So the sick pay is covered under the, um, the previous I actually don't have information about it on the screen here, but it's covered under that previous act where you'll get reimbursed for the sick pay through payroll tax credits. And um, just that, a little update that, on that. That's the, that's the uh, first part of the uh, CARES Act? The first, the first part of the CARES Act, or I think it, there was an act before that. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but, you know, it was a week ago. It seems like a year ago. But yeah. uh, under that act, basically any of us um, in this business are going to have 100% of the sick leave that we are responsible for paid for because there are caps on how much the federal government will reimburse you for with sick leave. Um, but those caps are well above what we, you know, what anybody in this business makes. So in terms of employees, so it's not something we really have to worry about from my reading of it. Um, so I know there's been a lot of concern of, oh my God, like I'm going to have to pay all these people sick leave. Um, and my answer to that is like, it's, you know, the only thing you have to do is front the money until your quarterly payroll taxes. Um, but it's, you're not, um, 
you're going to get reimbursed for that from the federal government. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, where were we? Oh yeah. The um, basically you see I highlighted here. I'm, if I'm not a hundred percent clear, I've highlighted it in yellow. This is just for myself. It's my own little system I have going. Um, but in the document I have from the U S chamber of commerce, it seems that um, uh, no matter how many people you've laid off, like, so my business is completely closed right now. We, I've laid off everybody except for my HR and administrative person. Okay. So um, if you return to pre-disaster employment levels by June 30th, all of these forgiveness amounts are 100% forgiven. So as long as you're back to full employment by June 30th, they'll forgive all of your expenses from eight weeks from the time you got the loan. So that's pretty cool. Um, and you say full employment, so that's not even necessarily the same people. Does not have to be the same people. Not from my reading of it. I, that's from three different sources. I, you know, wanted to make sure it doesn't have to be the same people. It's the same average number of employees. That's what they're looking for. Okay. Now, this is not talking about your revenue, though. So nope. uh, I know there's some concern there. If I'm not making enough money. Uh, Tom, can you mute while I'm talking? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'll mute too. Sorry. I, I think it can handle two people at a time, just not three. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, I know that there have been, there's been some talk that, um, that you have to have the, be paying the same amount of payroll, but they're not talking about your revenue. So you might have your people doing other things. Right? And just to check in real quick, um, are you able to see the live comments, Joe, over here? Right, you know, let's see here. On the um, right uh, side of my screen, I have choice, private chat and live comments. Oh, okay. Sorry, guys, I see it. If you hit the live comments, then you'll be able to respond. Like Charlotte, the answer for Charlotte is yes, that's correct. And then I haven't read um, Susan's, so maybe you could read hers and respond to that as well. And I'm going to go ahead and mute now. Yes. Okay. So does that SBA loan have to cover payroll? Or can we get it to pay mortgage utilities, et cetera, if your employees are on unemployment? So Susan, to answer your question, um, yes, you can get it to cover uh, mortgage utilities, et cetera. I don't know if I have that information here, but you're allowed to use it for that stuff, but they'll only forgive the the stuff that I've put here. So They'll only forgive payroll co costs, mortgage loan interest. So not the principal payments, but they'll forgive the interest and interest on other debt, lease payments and utility payments. Let me just see if that. And so, um, yeah, and, you know, I think, so this is where it gets kind of tricky and where you really need a good um, business advisor or a good CPA or someone to help you work through what's going to work best for your business. I know I have a lot of work to do on this, but, um, you know, just being realistic about where I think the the country is going to be in by June 30th and where our business, my business might be by June 30th. I'm not sure that I can return to our full level of employment by June 30th. So I'm looking at this loan thinking, Hmm. Well, I'm probably not going to be able to get all of it forgiven. And so until today, I couldn't get any good information on how that was prorated. So if you don't return to your full employment levels by June 30th, the amount they forgive of your expenses is prorated. And I finally got the formula for that today. So um, it, I've got a couple of examples here. So I'm going to go with what I think is kind of a likely scenario for our business by June 30th. Um, so we had um, an average of 30 employees in the in the period we're using to measure. Um, and previously, let's say by June 30th, I have 15 employees. So my estimated actual payroll cost would be $39,000 for that eight week period with an average of 15 employees. I have to divide that by the 30 employees from the previous period. And I, 
I know this is getting kind of technical, but that's what it does. It gets technical. But basically, you get to choose what you want to use for your previous period. Do you want to use the average number of employees you had between February 15th and June 30th of 2019? Or do you want to use the average number of employees you had from January 1st to February 29th, 2020? And so that's going to be up to you. But the point is, use whatever number is lower. So for me, I had fewer employees last year at this time, so I'm using that number. They're allowing you to choose what number you want to use to make it advantageous to you, the business owner. Okay, so I'm using um, 30 employees for the previous year average. And so that means they're going to reimburse 50 percent of of these above costs for me because I've essentially brought back 50 percent of my employees. So. I know that might be a little confusing, but they're basically reimbursing on a percentage based on how many the percentage of the employees you bring back. And again, we're, it can be any employees. It doesn't have to be the employees you had before, but they're just looking at the number of employees that you have. And so you'll have to work through these numbers and figure out if it's going to make sense for you or not to get this loan. But that's the that's kind of the overview of the PPP as I understand it right now. So. You know, my summary would be if you think you can be at pre-crisis staffing levels by June 30th, this is a no brainer. The federal government's going to be paying for your payroll for eight weeks. And in our business, payroll is 50 percent of our cost. So that is an absolute no brainer. If you um, don't think you can be at the full employment levels by June 30th, then you need to do some number crunching and figure out if it's going to make sense for you or not. Um, so that's kind of the summary that I came at today with that. Is that the question uh, you have here? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, um, Linda, yes, we can get a copy of the notes out. Absolutely. Um, and let's see, Kassir says we provide part-time legal daily or monthly basis, no agency. Oh, okay, that looks like an ad. Okay, Robin Stevenson, any clarity on employees, unemployment versus payroll protection? Can the employee select a better option? Um, so uh, to answer your question, Robin, um, I that's a very good question. Whether um, So Robin's asking if there's um, any clarity on employees who, being on unemployment versus, uh, you know, us bringing them back and getting their payroll reimbursed. And can the employee select the better option for them? I think that that's a really hard question. I think that one of the issues that I'm having right now today is, is figuring out how to navigate this because in my state with the new federal unemployment um, you know, supplement that they're doing, the $600 a week, um, with the way unemployment benefits are working in my state, it means that all of my employees are gonna be making more money staying home than they will be coming back to work right now. And so it kind of, and we pay our employees really well. I mean, they make an average of 17 bucks an hour, I think, something somewhere around there. But, um, you know, uh, it puts us in a tough position because you want to bring people back, but you're kind of asking them to take a pay cut to come back unless you can figure out a way to pay them more right now. And I don't have a good answer for that. Um, and I, that's going to be something that we as business owners are going to have to get more clarity on in the coming days, I think, as more guidance comes out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there's so much confusion on this and we do need more clarity because theoretically, if you offer somebody their job back and they refuse it, then you can go back to the state agency that manages unemployment and they would lose that benefit. That's right. That's right. And then, but then, you know, as a business owner, you have to, like, for me, it becomes a moral question, right? Because I don't want to. So, you know, Right now, our plan is we're going to bring back our highest performing employees first. And we have a way that we define that. It's right in our employee handbook. So it's dependability to date, the, the skill level that they are have, that they have, et cetera. So, um, you know, I would look at my highest level employees with the best dependability and bring those back first, right? But what we're actually asking them to do, if I do that, is I'm asking them to come back to work for a pay cut. And that just doesn't, to me... And come and work in a riskier environment. So, you know, come and work in a riskier COVID infested environment, potentially COVID infested environment, and um, take a pay cut to do it. Like to me, that just doesn't seem right. So 
I'm waiting for more guidance to come out in terms of that piece because I don't feel comfortable with that. And I think a lot of people would agree that doesn't seem right to me. And I'm not going to I don't want to be put in the position of having to like kind of force my highest performing employees to like lose their unemployment benefits if they're that generous right now. So there's been some conversation about um, since there is going to be the PPP, is there any way to maybe bring back your highest performing people at, you know, a, a premium COVID pay pay um, during this time, you know, for maybe a total of eight weeks or 16 weeks or whatever it is, or, you know, maybe an extra $5 an hour or something like that. Have you thought of that or um, um, what are your thoughts there, Joe? Um, I think that's a very good idea. I think it's a great question. So something I've batted around is the idea of uh, like um, like hazard pay, which I think a lot of employees across the country are getting right now. And I think that it's um, I think that it's warranted in, you know, certain circumstances. Um, so I think it's a good idea, but the first thing I need to do before I make any decisions on that is run the numbers and just, it has to make sense, you know? And, and what I don't want to do is bring all my employees back just to meet the full employment standard, but then have to lay them all off again. Like, so I'm, you know what I mean? I'm trying to avoid, you know, June 30th is an eternity from now. So how am I supposed to project if I think business is going to be back? So you know, there's just a lot, a lot that's unanswered. So I'm just trying to focus on what I do know right now, which is, hey, I have a formula for this so I can start running models and see what makes sense. You would have to think, and I guess time will tell, but I am I believe that when the dust settles, the rules will be modified in a way where it's more rational for somebody to go back to work than for them to take unemployment. I don't know what that looks like, but it would just seem like they're undercutting one of their main initiatives in terms of getting everybody back to work if they've created a financial incentive for people not to go back to work. So somehow, I mean, there's, I mean, we haven't talked about the SBA website yet. How many times that's changed over the last week? I mean, they're so far behind the curve in getting this thing figured out that, you know, once they when they get to it, there's got to be some modifications to where it's more economically rational for people to be working than for them to just say, no, I'm making more money not working. And, you know, I, I, I'm I with you on that, Tom. And I again, that's why I just think give this two or three more days and it'll be back clear. <laughs> I think, you know, I think Robin has a really good point, you know, and, and I've actually heard this from a couple of other people that the logic, Robin says, the logic from Congress is that the employee will have to weigh having a full-time job for four months rather than taking the extra $600 per week for four months. You know, I need to understand more about that and how how the benefit can be distributed over the next um time period between now and the end of the year. So I just need to understand that better. Um, because, you know, I agree with the commenters that are saying that, you know, if we bring them back and pay them more for the time being that they're going to stay with us. I totally agree with that. I, it just needs to work financially. I need to make sure that we're doing the best. We need to make sure we're threading this needle, right? As business owners, where it's, we're doing the best thing for our business and for our employees and for our customers. So you, we have to keep all the stakeholders in mind um, when it comes to that. Um, I, I did wanna point out something here, Joe, I'm um, going up to Charlotte's question. She says, if they choose to resign to make more money, then will they still be a, a, um, eligible for unemployment? And I, I think that this is where people keep getting confused. It's, it's not the employee's choice. It's it's right now it's on us. If we have work and we want to keep people employed or we decide not to, right now this decision is on us. They can't choose to not work to be able to make that extra money and they just won't be eligible. And along the same lines, if we've laid them off and we pull them back, they can't say no. You know, I, I prefer to stay on unemployment and continue making this money. So there's two sides here to look at. And it, I think it just keeps turning into like a, a you know, the Eschers, uh, you know, all those, 
those twisty things, right? You sort of get hooked in on yourself there. So maybe you could speak a little bit to that, Joe. Well, uh, I, I mean, I think some of that is depends on your state. So I can just speak to, so I operate in Maine and in Maine, the emergency unemployment legislation that was passed uh, last week um, means that all of my employees that I laid off are all getting um, the emergency unemployment benefit, which is the same amount as the regular unemployment benefit, but just there was no one week waiting period. And now they're eligible for the federal benefit on top of that. Neither of those in my state, it doesn't impact my unemployment insurance rating at all. So it's not costing me anything to have them on unemployment. It, so as far as I'm concerned, my message to my employees at the moment, pending different guidance, is do what's best for you. And we're in a state of emergency. We're operating in a pandemic. And look, I think it's important to keep in mind that when, when you are a, a, a housekeeper, well, let me phrase that differently. When you're an EMT or a nurse or a doctor or, you know, working in a hospital, you're signing up to deal with with public health crises when they arise. And this is your moment. And this is like your chance to be a hero. And, and I don't say that. I say that in all seriousness and have so much adoration for everything those people are doing right now. But that's not our people. Housekeepers didn't sign up to be on the front lines of a pandemic and they don't have the training typically and the sort of, they weren't, they didn't sign up for this. So I don't think it's fair. And again, this is a judgment call and I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to put this on anyone, but this is just my own moral compass telling me that I don't believe it's fair to force them to come back to work. So at least until the state of emergency is over. So like, you know, at the moment, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to say you have to come back or I'm going to report you as denying, you know, my offer of a job to you. I'm just not going to not going to do that because this isn't what anybody signed up for. And um, so for me, the calculus of, well, unemployment benefits affecting my own, you know, personal financial situation goes out the window because I just I'm not going to be put in that position. But you have to make the decision that's right for you. Thanks, Joe. Super helpful. Um, I, I think it's really good for people to see that this is multifaceted decision and everybody's going to have to make that decision based on what, what they believe. I, uh, and, got a couple more. Sorry, Joe, go ahead. No, I just also want to say that, you know, the, there is a self-serving part to that as well, that I'm not, you know, I'm not being totally, uh, this isn't just altruism here. I'm being realistic. And I know that so far, all of my employees have given incredible feedback to how we've responded to this. And the way that I've responded is by being transparent with them. And the transparent part of the transparency is, look, I'm working to protect you and to protect the business. And I'm going to do both. So they know that that's what I'm doing. And I'm just transparent with them about it. And uh, they just really have responded really well to that. And, um, you know, the decision might be harder if you're in a state where you're having to pay unemployment insurance now because all your people are laid off. That might change it for you. So, you know, I think you have to look at that. But I do think that transparency piece um, translates uh, across across the board. What I found is the companies who are staying open and being transparent and talking to their mm -hmm. employees about the, the risks and everything else, those people are very loyal and they want to go out and clean. So I think it's the same thing. Um, that transparency piece is really, really important. They, the employees are wanting to feel like they can trust their company and that, okay. that their company has their best, best interest in mind, what, whichever way that's going and however that's going. They, they just want to believe that they have um, – they're working together with their company. And, and so I think it's really important to set goals for your company through the crisis. So like um, I'm just sharing my screen again here. And this is where, um, you know, I've set the, these are our three goals. Very simple. Um, but these have now been shared with my staff. And I'm going to share them with my clients in the next email I send out, which will probably be tomorrow at this point. But our number one priority is that we want to contribute to the community effort to slow the spread of the virus. And um, everyone so far has completely respected that. 
and been excited to be a part of that, whatever that means. The second thing is ensure the health and safety of our staff and our clients. And then the third is to ensure the long-term health and continuity of the business. So we're looking at all three of those things all the time. And everybody knows that. And I'm just consistently in my communications with the, with the um, employees and the customers talking about that. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Matt Rickett said it best recently when he said, um, I'm not going to resume operations until I know I'm part of the solution and not part of the problem. And I just need to make sure I feel comfortable with that. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but this is also a very this is also a local crisis. So your response is going to depend partially on what's going on in your own local area. So where I operate is the hot spot in the state of Maine in Cumberland County. So. I just didn't feel comfortable staying open. Um, so that's an interesting thought, Joe, because, you know, it, is it possible that, that a company could, could get too far ahead of this, that wanting to do the right thing, they shut down, but maybe they should have stayed open a couple of weeks and, and you know, waited until things, you know, got a little, you know, hotter maybe before shutting down when you know the, the local government or state government or whatever kind of tells them to do it i mean maybe i think you know i think the argument can be made that that you know you have a responsibility to your employees and your business and you need to do everything you can to keep things going um you know so that you know you don't want to close i think i was the first one that i knew of to completely close um i was a little on the earlier side uh, but I'm really glad that I did because now, you know, my employees are taken care of and it's giving me the breathing room that I need to figure out our next steps. So, um, so we could read some of the questions over here on the right, you guys. we got some stuff going on. Yep. Yeah. So I'm seeing um, uh, some questions here. Let's see. My Susan asked, my employees that are now laid off still have the supplies and equipment that I distribute to them. Should I get it all back? Um, I think that's a personal choice. Uh, so argument for taking it back is I don't want the moonlighting with my equipment while we're shut down. Um, and I think that's a valid argument. There could be liability issues there. Um, and so that's also a valid argument. Argument against doing that maybe would be that you don't want to. Uh, to me, it's more of a psychological one. Um, and Liz, I think you would understand this. I don't want to send the message that you're done here. So I'm not asking for them to bring the supplies back. It's more of just a psychological thing. Like I don't, you know, I don't want to send the message that, you know, I'll give you an example. My brother-in-law was laid off from his job because of this. Uh, and it was supposed to be temporary, but they said, come clean out your desk. And they escorted him onto the campus of the company and escorted him off and like, take all your belongings. So that didn't really send the message that it was temporary. You know, <laughs> I said, well, that's kind of a little, you know, that's kind of a weird way to handle it. If it's supposed to be temporary and we're all in this together. So a, a, var a variation of that. And the question I've, I've heard ask is, should we be getting uniforms back, like company shirts back? And along that lines, you know, what is the value of that shirt versus the value of that employee feeling like they're still part of the team? Still part of the team. That's exactly it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think our, our valid argument either way, but that's that to me is the major pro and con there. I, I might say one way that you could um, deal with that, Susan, also is maybe you leave, let them keep out their uniforms um, because they're part of the team, but bring in all the equipment because we want to have it all clean, sanitized, disinfected, et cetera. So if, if you're concerned about that, that would, that would be a way to be able to bring it back in, but still leave people feeling whole. Yeah, that's that's really good idea, actually. Yep. Um, hey, Liz. <laughs> uh, um, so I might use that one, Liz. So um, Robin, Robin says, with the payment protection program, can the employees who work receive the earned wages plus the payment protection payment? Uh, so just to be clear, to my understanding, the payment protection, the, it's the payroll protection program through the SBA that we were just talking about. And that is reimbursed. Um, sorry, it's not reimbursed. It comes in the form of a loan. And then you just don't have to pay that portion of the loan back. So the assumption is that you're employing these folks. So, you know, the answer would be um, uh, that 
they're just getting their earned wages. So if you decided to pay these employees more because you knew that you were getting partially reimbursed from the government, then that's your choice. But um, they're really the employees don't receive direct compensation from the payroll protection program. It, it, it comes from you. And then the government just doesn't get take their loan money back. Hope that answers the, the question. Um, Charlotte says I've laid off four employees so far, but I have 20 left. Will I still be eligible for the loan or do I have to try and bring those people back? Okay. <laughs> yes. And they can sit on the couch and make more money. We were just talking about that. Um, so the answer is from my reading of it, again, I really encourage you to find professional advice here, but my reading of it is that, um, is that no, you don't need to bring everybody back. In fact, they're saying you could lay everybody off tomorrow. And um, really all they're considering is all that's going to matter is your employment levels for the eight weeks after you get the loan. And then again, by um, June 30th. So it does, it's actually specifically says in some of the um, literature I was reading today that it doesn't matter if you lay people off, like starting now until, you know, there was something, maybe it was over the next 30 days or something. I can't remember exactly, but I would say, Charlotte, that if you feel like you need to lay off more employees, go ahead and do it. It's not going to affect, from what I can read, it's not going to affect your eligibility for the program. You just need um, to, hire you to bring them back, though. So you just Sorry. hired the people on June 30th. Is that the deal? <laughs> well, if you have to be back fully by June 30th, yes. But to be clear, you only have to be back fully by June 30th to get all of the money. To get uh, all of the money. And this is it. where it gets tricky, right? Because I think they did this so that you can't like kind of game the system and get a bunch of free money from the government. So like you, for this is how I read it. Um, if you're back to full employment, let's say you hire 30 people on June 29th, okay? They are only going to though forgive the um, the payroll for the eight weeks from the time you originated the loan. You have to remember that. So if you originated the loan on May 1st and uh, that eight week period is going to end June 30th. So by hiring 30 people on June 29th, that's a, they're not going to get paid for all that. You know, it's only from the loan origination date. So there is an argument for actually waiting to accept the loan until later Again, this is something that you have to work out yourself. <laughs> it's going to be different for everybody. That's interesting, Joe. Say if one gets approved for the loan now, but you're you're thinking, I'm it's I'm going to be down a month before I can start, you know, working again. Can you accept it? Say, yeah, you know, I want the money, but not today. I want it a month from now. You know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. So that would be, you know, something where we wait more guidance on. Um, it seems like these are the ones I have to keep checking my own notes because I keep forgetting. It seems like, are these the ones? Yep. Um, these you go through a local bank. So the, the PPP um, is through a local bank. So you should be able to talk to your local bank. And by the way, the banks don't have the guidance on this yet. So you can, I would contact your local bank. Even they don't, they still aren't exactly sure the SBA is still bringing the guidance down for them. So Tom, I think that'd be a question you could ask your local bank once the time comes. I know that I did contact our local bank and they said, you know, that this wasn't available yet, but we got on the list of people that they're going to call when it is. So, I mean, I, I might recommend that you contact, contact your local bank and find out Get on, get yeah. on there. They're going to start calling people. So, yeah, yeah. If you haven't already received notice from them, like I have a relationship with a local bank, and then also with Key Bank, which is like a big regional bank. And Key Bank's already emailed me and told me that they can do this PPP thing. So they, some banks might start reaching out to you proactively. Um, Greg, real quick. Sorry, before oh. we. Sorry, Greg. Um, uh, uh, sorry, what was it? Oh, this question was for Tom. Tom, we have been talking about this date that kept changing. It was April 2nd, then it was April 1st. Be safe, do it, do whatever it was on the 31st. We keep all of these different dates. I completely forgot what is this thing and is it still something that needs to, we need to make the decision about beforehand? 
the the date according to the most recent thing i read from 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 don finn was technically anybody you have on your payroll april 1st can qualify for paid fmla and paid sick time there was a thought that it had to be the second but he came out with some guidance last week and i haven't seen anything today so i don't know if anything's changed there or not but all of that was, was per pertaining to to paid FMLA and paid sick time. And if you didn't uh, have anybody on your payroll, you know, after that date, then you didn't have to worry about it. But theoretically, anybody on your payroll from, from, from April, April 1st on could be a candidate and qualify for, right. for those benefits. And you would, you, you'd get the, you could get that money back through some of these other, you know, programs that we're talking about. But you have to have the cash up front to, to, to make those payments. So, so to be clear and, and, and uh, on this with the FMLA and the paid sick leave, those we're going to get reimbursed a hundred percent on that. So it's not, it is an upfront cost. Okay. But it's not something that, um, and you have to remember it's an upfront cost and it's only going to apply for people who it affects. It's not like you're going to have to pay all 20 of your staff FMLA and stuff like that. Right. What is this? Just those three criteria. Yeah. Right? So it's, go ahead, Joe. And so it's important to remember that. So I just, you know, I think I've seen a lot of panic on the boards around that. And I just think that, like, let's just remember that it's only for, like, certain situations. And, you know, um, I don't, we don't really have time to get into the specifics here, but it's only for certain situations. And also, um, you're going to get reimbursed 100% for, all of that. So I just think it, you know, businesses that are big enough to have a, like, if you have 30 employees, I would think you would have access to enough capital short term to cover the, you know, two or three or four employees or however many would be fall under that at one time. I will say, however, that by closing when I did and laying everybody off, it made it a lot easier for me to get to have the time to get my head around all this. Because the other the other thing about closing that it's a, that it has enabled me to do for those of you that are on the fence should I close should I not close I will tell you that it has enabled me like for example I spent four hours today learning about all these different mechanisms that are coming into place and it's also giving myself and my HR admin person in the office time to revamp our own. Um, manual and do like a temporary employee manual supplement for all these emergency regulations and also get our payroll system ready so that, you know what I mean? So it's actually given us a little breathing room. Um, so that's been one of the advantages of fully closing. And the fact that I closed before the April 1st means that like, I don't have to worry about any of the employees that are now laid off. I don't have to worry about that provision. It's only as I start bringing them back. So it kind of gave us a nice clean slate, just but, an but advantage. If you do have employees going into April and if any of them qualify and Liz, you mentioned the three things. So I guess if, if, if you're sick or if you're caring for someone who's sick or if yep. your kids are out of, out of school, school. Yep. And those are like three criteria and this uh, emergency loan program that we were talking about earlier, if you go to the SBA website, the initial $10,000, as I understand it, is supposed to show up in your bank account in three days. And I believe the intent of that in part is to give you some extra cash to deal with things like, you know, people making paid FMLA if that pops up. Right and away. also remember that um, this is an important point. There's a 30 day grace period in enforcement. So from April 1st to April 30th or 31st, I don't remember how many days are in April. It's not really enforceable. So if you make a mistake, no one's going to, no one's enforcing it. That's an important point, I think, to understand too. Um, to kind of have less than the anxiety about what am I going to do if I don't get this right, you know? And one more point, too, that Tom is always talking about, that you have the protection of the masses. So don't want to forget that little piece, too, that while this is going on, it's not just you out there all by yourself. And if you make a mistake, you're the one person. That <laughs> made you're, the, you're the only company in the country that didn't get it right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, and just in another plug for closing, um, 
is that, you know, if you're trying to weigh that decision right now, I can just, because I've been closed for over a week now, um, I can also say that um, it's, it's given us time, getting our head around all of this stuff allows us to uh, present ourselves and actually become experts in the changes that are happening, which is really great for instilling confidence in our employees and instilling confidence in our customers. So it's also having that headspace and having that bandwidth to really wrap your head around the new world now that we have COVID in it um, has enabled us to become professionals at it so that when we do reopen, we hit the ground running and we're ready with all the systems and the information that we need to do it right. And um, we've gotten really good feedback on employees, how appreciative they are that we're staying on top of it and, you know, working to make sure we're doing it right. So and the customers appreciate it, too. So it's something else to remember. I did see, um, I need to say there, Linda um, has a concern about how long our clients will wait for us to come back before seeking out another service. I agree completely. It's something that I've been losing sleep over. I have customers right now that I know I'm going to lose if I don't reopen next week. Um, the thing is, is that I don't, I think I have bad news for those customers because I don't think we're going to reopen next week. I just don't see it happening. Uh, what I'm trying to do, Linda, is come up with a uh, succinct, um, like a succinct way of telling that story that uses third party sources to say that I can cite and say, hey, look, until this like emergency declaration is lifted or until the personal protective equipment is available in our supply chain or whatever the things are that I'm looking for, we're not going to reopen and just share that message with the customers and just hope that the ones that you really want to keep as customers are going to understand that and stick with you. And maybe these ones that think that getting their house cleaned is so important during a national pandemic that they're going to fire you over it because you, you're trying to keep your employees safe. I don't really want them anyway. And that's, I have to just keep falling back on that. It all comes back to our original goals and how are we meeting those goals and it's just sticking, sticking to that and understanding that I have to keep stealing myself that I'm probably going to lose customers over it. And it's, I don't know. And, and to be clear, it doesn't really matter which side you fall on, whether you're staying open and you have your own moral reasons for staying open and, or oh, just you're closing. Sorry. Oh, well. Or if you're closing, can one of you guys mute? Oh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. If you're staying open or if you're closing, either one of those things, you have to stand strong to your moral reasoning, it's the flip-flopping that's gonna cause you trouble. If you have a reason, a strong reason, and a strong story for why you're staying open and how you believe that this is better for the community, et cetera, tell that story and make sure that you tell that story in a way that people believe it like you believe it so that they can get behind it and, and support you. And on the flip side, if you're closing because you morally believe that this is the best way to protect the community and correct, uh, protect your employees, stand strong with that that message. You know, you, the flip flopping is is what's going to cause you trouble. You think that? Uh, I guess we're kind of getting to the end of of our hour here, uh, Joe. Thank you so very much for uh, everything that you've shared here. Um, really, really useful stuff. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and go to. While you're doing that, Tom, I'm going to try and hit some of these real fast. I feel bad that we did not answer as many questions as we normally do. Um, Greg wants to know, how do you communicate a job offer that was declined to the unemployment office? Um, I would say that I would put any job offers in writing just because it's always going to be the safer way to do it. Um, the next thing, I agree with Joe, but there is that unknown factor and concern of how long will our clients get? We already got that one. Joe, did you find out how to apply for a waiver from the sick leave and new FMLA laws? That is not that those details aren't there yet. Sorry, Robin. Um, per the unemployment benefits, the way I re read and understand after speaking to a family member who works for California EDD unemployment 
is up to $600 weekly, not a guaranteed $600 weekly. That is not what any of the people that I have spoken to have, have um, interpreted it to mean. I have, everyone I've talked to has interpreted it to mean $600 on top of, and so we might want to have a little bit more discussion around that. I don't know. If you, have, if, you, if you have that in writing somewhere, if there's a website or a document or anything that you could share with us, that would be really good because that's the answer we're looking for. <laughs> we all want that. We would love to see that, T. If you could shoot us something in writing, would be awesome. Our, our stance last week is that that's what was going to happen, that people were going to get an additional $600 that was available to make sure that they were brought 100% whole, but that's not what we are reading now. I'm gonna shoot through these and we can have more conversation in a minute. The ones I laid off, Charlotte says, the ones I laid off, I got all their supplies back, no clue what they want, okay. Um, yes, Teresa, Greg is thinking the same thing as Teresa. Um, we brought it back to clean and tuna. I'm not sure exactly what, Greg is saying there, we, oh, the, the equipment. Yeah, we brought it back to clean it and tune it up, yay. Uh, Sarah says, if we are closed down and we take the PPP, would we continue to pay them to stay home? Anybody wanna to speak to that? We spoke a little bit to that earlier. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'll, be, I'll jump in there. Sorry, I lost my internet connection for a minute there, guys. Um, so to Sarah's question, I think that that's a risky strategy um, because you may just have to lay them off again if you don't actually have the business there. So I think part of the answer to that question, Sarah, is going to depend on what your state unemployment is doing to supplement the federal unemployment. That would be my stance on it. I just think it's risky to pay people to stay home because then you just might have to lay them off again. And when you lay them off again, you might not be protected under some kind of emergency unemployment. You know what I mean? I think it's a little early to say that that's a good idea. And plus, it's a culture thing, and you're developing habits that you're not going to want to live with in the long run. I mean, if you create a situation where people are used to you paying them and they're not working, there's going to come a day when you're going to want them to work, and that might not, they might not like that idea at that point. So I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't open that can of worms. And also keeping in mind, Sarah, that, um, it, you have a little bit of time here still. Give it, give it a day or two, like like Joe was saying. Even though that doesn't sound like very much time right now, one day is a lot of time. A lot of stuff's happening just even in a 24-hour period. Uh, let's see. We have Linda with her children, their family. That's great. That's I think that's the message that we're we're recommending to Linda. Stay in touch and um, make them feel like they're they're part of your company. Sarah, if we're working, we have some revenue coming in, would we use the loan to pay them, but the revenue coming in to pay them extra? Talk a little bit about how that might work, Sarah. And a lot of these kinds of conversations are conversations you're going to want to have with your accountant and figuring out the, the you know, what those numbers are for you and how they work. So it's not answers that we can really give you here. And then um, Robin, so can the employee earn both the earned wages and company provides the employee the portion of the paycheck allocated to them had they not worked that week? Somebody else can have to get that one. My brain went a little crazy on that question. I'm not um, sure. If I, I'm not sure if yep. I follow. I, I think if I understand that, Robin, like it's 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 a it's a variation on the question that was asked earlier. Um, and um, understand that that's going to be totally up to you. The SBA is providing you with the funds. They're going to go into your bank account and how you spend them is partially up to you, but you're only going to get reimbursed for payroll expenses and the other expenses that are on that list I showed you. And yes, I will share. I'm happy to share that document however I can. But um, so, you know, when you ask, can the employee earn the earned wages and the portion of the paycheck allocated to them had they not worked? I guess if you're talking about can they collect partial unemployment, that depends on your state. Some states allow partial unemployment. It's called work sharing and some don't. So it depends on your state. 
Um, but in terms of how you're paying them, remember the SBA is giving you the money. It's in your bank account. You can use it to pay all these different expenses and the payroll portion of that, they won't ask for it back. You don't have to pay it back. But that also gets into the $600 coming from the federal government. It does. That yeah. prorated and there's a long list of regs that haven't been written yet. Yeah. And I'll just say, like, uh, I did see another question here about um, uh, did I get a link for something, um, how to apply for a waiver for the sick leave and new FMLA? Um, yeah. So the sources that are in the document that I'll share, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, there's a Senate subcommittee on small business, a couple of other sources, they all contain the links to that waiver application. And yes, you can apply for that. Um, so I just wanted to that's, that's new information for me too. Thanks, Joe. That's super helpful. Yeah. Um, so Bridget says when I have an employee who doesn't want to work from fear, I legally can't lay them off when there is work question mark. Is there a workaround? Joe touched upon this earlier. We talked about this last week. You know, if I'm a first responder, if I'm a healthcare worker, that's part of my job description. Um, legally, I don't know what, you know, all the issues are, I guess that's a state by state thing, but it would be hard to penalize somebody for them refusing to do something that arguably isn't part of their job description to begin with. I would agree. I would say that if you have an employee who doesn't want to work due to fear, I wouldn't be I'd be trying to figure out how you can allow them to stay home and collect unemployment benefits. And again, that's a culture thing for me, but like they didn't sign up for this and I think they have a valid concern. And I think that the, uh, my prediction would be that the employers that are able to work with that and respect that. Now I'm assuming this is a high performing employee otherwise. Okay. But assuming this is a great employee, otherwise, if you're able to work with that employee and, and make it happen for them, um, they're going to stay with you. And I think that's more valuable than trying to force somebody to come to work right now, regardless of what the legal, you know, uh, piece of it is. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, so. But to be clear, he will, neither one of these guys is saying go against the law. They're saying I'm not. Find, find a way to remain legal and um, – and meet the needs of your people and, and protect them as best you can. Yeah, I, I would say that I would phrase that in, in a way and saying like, you know, uh, um, find a way to optimize the current regulatory environment, you know, to benefit your employees and your business the most and do however that, whatever that means to you, you know. I mean, everybody's trying to figure this out, guys. Like this is all... Like everyone's confused, okay? Everyone is confused. I have a, um, I've been getting a lot of great updates from a, 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 one of our state senators uh, serves the city of Portland where I'm at, Portland, Maine on the, on, on the East Coast. And um, our state senator uh, in Portland, Maine, she owns a brewery and she has like 40 employees. She's a lawyer and a state senator and runs a 40 employee, um, very successful business. And she's confused. I mean, she's very open about that. She's doing everything she can to help to help us understand it. And she's got a newsletter going to fellow small business owners. But everybody's confused, guys. So, you know, that's it's it's to be expected, I guess, would be my would be what I would say. We all have to, to deal with the ambiguity right now. <laughs> trying to zip through a few more of these real quick, because I know, Tom, we're like way over our time. And this is yeah. Great. A lot. Joe, would you like to join us again sometime later this week, maybe, and we could pick up the discussion? Yep, I'd love to. And I also see Regina. I just want to say I, I, I do see your question here directed at me for those of us who have known only growth. How do you communicate this with your employees, et cetera, et cetera? Um, again, I would go back to set goals for yourself through this. What are your priorities? W you know, what's guiding your decisions through this? And then communicate that with your employees. I'm happy to share a series of communications I've shared with my employees 
Um, and generally, you know, just being transparent, letting them know where you're at and um, giving them all the resources that you can to help um, keep them comfortable and safe right now. I mean, that's basically what we're doing. It's going to be different for everybody. But I think what's not different is setting goals and being transparent. I think that's just how I would advise you to do that. Real quick. Yes, a lot of people are concerned about the shorter SBA form after we just had the longer conversation on Friday. Yes, that's one of the things that happens real quick. Yes, they've shortened that form. Don't worry that you're in the wrong place now. They've taken away the long form and now there's the short form. So, now one question, one question that has come up that would probably be important to answer is, if I've already filed the long form, do I need to go back in and do the short form? Or a variation of that is I've started the long form but haven't uploaded all of the documents. What, what, what do I do? Um, I've been looking for an answer for that, like an official answer from the SBA and Googling various things and have not been able to find an answer. Joe, do you, have you heard one? So I did the long form and uh, neglected to submit any documentation along with it. It wasn't until I was talking about it with Tom that he told me, oh yeah, you were supposed to submit all this other stuff. Um, you should so, have been here Friday. <laughs> yeah, I should have been on the call Friday. Um, no, but I, I, I have done both and I would just say do both. I would just say do it. I mean, it's not, there's nothing, there's no harm in doing it. The short form, I just did it this afternoon. It literally takes 15 minutes or less, less than that and just do it and just get in line. That's what I would do. That, that's not, you know, officially I can't find anything, but that's the same advice I've been giving people. It's like, if well, I'm going to be wrong, I'm going to be wrong by doing it twice. Yeah. Worst case scenario is they give you two loans, you give one back. <laughs> exactly. And they're, that's they're, the worst. <laughs> I, I did get the guidance that they're categorizing it by EIN number. So, you know, you won't, They'll eventually figure out that you've got two applications in the system, but I wouldn't worry about it right now. They're they're all overwhelmed, so I wouldn't worry about. Don't try to call them or anything. Just apply again. <laughs> They'll figure it out. You know. Okay, I'm going to share with you our Cleaning Business Today website, cleaningbusinesstoday.com. That's uh, uh, who we are, and this is where we're posting all our information. Over here to the right is where you subscribe. I has, had uh, some feedback last week that this wasn't working. I've been testing it and it works for me with just a, a valid email address, first name, last name. If anybody tries to subscribe and they run into any problems, please, please let me know. But it seems to be working for us. And if you go here and there's a hidden link called coronavirus dash downloads, it takes you to all of our resources and some of the really good material that, that, that Joe shared with us. We'll be taking uh, some of the, the information that, that, that he's going to, to allow us to share and we'll, we'll post that here for, for, for download along with a lot of other forms and resources and, and, and useful information. And I'll take this link here and we'll post it in the chat. I'll make that go away. If if I could just, there, there's a couple of key points that we didn't cover that I think are important before we wrap up. One is that when you apply with the SBA short form online, what you're applying for is the disaster loan, which we didn't even talk about today, and um, that grant, the $10,000. The PPP, the Paycheck Protection or Payroll Protection Program, that you apply for through an SBA approved lender. So like your local bank, that's gonna be a separate application. So I just wanna make sure that we're clear about that because that is important to understand. But, and I didn't understand that till this afternoon. So the SBA form online is the disaster loan, which we didn't even talk about today, which is a whole separate thing, and the $10,000 grant. And then your local bank is the Payroll Protection Program. And then the second point is there's also uh, an employee retention credit that we didn't even talk about that um, where you get a, a break on your payroll taxes up to $5,000. Well, it's 50% of the first $10,000 of every employee. Um, so it's up to $5,000 per employee for wages paid. Um, 
during some time period around the crisis. It's in my notes. I don't know off the top of my head, but that's important. If you get the PPP, you're not eligible for that. But I think for some businesses, that um, employee retention tax credit might make more sense than the PPP. So it's just something that's good to be aware of. It should be in your... Uh-oh. Looks like um, Joe's taking a little nap right here, but uh, maybe that's good timing for us to realize that we definitely need to bring Joe back if at all possible and address some of these things. Consideration. Uh, yep. Uh-oh, he's gone. Oh, he's back. Sorry guys, it's, uh, it's mountain internet up here. <laughs> it's, it's cold, I know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be talking more about this in the in the in the days ahead. Um, Joe is really a busy guy, and he, he, I mean, he has a great job of managing multiple priorities in his time. Well, I, I I am grateful, and I'm sure everybody else here as well that that you're helping us out here today and um, come back later this week and. I just I just want to thank you, Tom and Liz, for being such great leaders. And this is like, I mean, it, now more than ever, we need you guys. And it's really great that you're that you're doing what you're doing. So thank you. It's awesome. Nothing happens without y'all, right? <laughs> thank you. We're, we're hey, Tom. Tomorrow, guys. So uh, tomorrow, 5 o'clock Eastern, we'll pick up the discussion then. Yep. Anything Sounds else? Uh, Tom, one thing. Uh, tomorrow on your tell it like it is, Tom, is there any way that we could get like a list of all of the potential loans and grants? Because we keep hearing stuff like, like we haven't even talked about this and this thing is not that. And some people are calling um, a loan an EIDL. Other people are calling it a uh, disaster loan. What, you know, what's what? All of these different names. Any way? Or the tell it like it is. We could just get like a, a clean list, or is that too difficult? Joe, oh. you're 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 you're. Is, is tomorrow cool? Can yep. You, is I already cool? have a list. I already have a list. Yeah. We, we we're we're good. That's that's a great idea, Liz. Okay, guys. Seriously, um, dinner time here. We'll uh, <laughs> see you guys uh, tomorrow, Bye, guys. Eastern. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.